Okay. So in last lecture, what we saw was uh, we we had uh, this data imported into uh, the Weka interface, and uh, what we did was we applied few classification models. We also applied the discretization. But uh, what we found, what we found was uh, we used to get very poor accuracy. If I'm not wrong, it was around 34%, right? 34, 36 or something, which is not at all acceptable to us. So what we will do is, now today we'll see like how we can solve that problem. Like you have done all that. We wanted to look at this as a classification. We have done a ranges. So what is that wrong we are doing that and how we can uh, improve the machine learning, right? So these were the variables, which these were the data sets of that. And if I'm not wrong, we never wanted to use G1 and G2. We wanted to predict G3, like likelihood of student uh, ability, students, the factors affecting students ability to school score well in the final test. We are ignoring G1 and G2. Because uh, what we saw is that G1, G2, G3 are highly correlated and I want to only predict final grade. That's a small attempt to predict the direct likelihood of student grade. So G1 and G2, we will remove that. And if I'm not wrong on G3 was numeric. What we wanted was what we wanted. We never wanted to do a linear regression and predict it because uh, we can if we want because it's a numeric and we can do that but considering the real world statistics like i wanted a model which can be a, a reliable model it could be plus or minus some range but i wanted a model which i can rely as a staff if i can rely on that uh, that how this student is going to perform likely i can take some corrective actions on student to improve his grades okay so what we had decided was we have to we have decided that we will convert g3 into nominal values nominal in the sense categorical values and we, we did it by using some discretization and all that but the problem was that uh, we had created some uh, for five six classes or ten uh, eight ten classes and it it goes automatically on its own and it does it but the problem was that when i want when i when we ran the classification the problem was that uh, we used to get a very poor accuracy. I mean, something is wrong in the day, the way we are doing the feature engineering. Remember, now we are looking at a concept called as feature engineering. When we applied all that and we when we find when we find a poor accuracy, there could be two reasons. Either the data and the value or the information in the data is not proper enough to predict the problem. Case one. Case two. We have a data, but we are unable to put and structure the data in a proper format so that my ML algorithms can learn. Case three, you have data, you have a structure, but you are failing to recognize right ML algorithm to apply on that so that you get a good accuracy or good learnability from out of that. So these are the three possibilities. When we get a low accuracy, these are the three possibilities. The first thing, can you rule out first? You can only rule out first when your case two and case three fails, even after ensuring the data is properly structured, even after trying all possible ML algorithms, if you still get a lower accuracy, maybe our assumption that classification can use to, to predict this or the data itself doesn't have a valuable information in it such that we can use that data to predict this problem as a classification problem. So. We will not work on one. So today our intention would be to make sure that case three and case two will not, we will work on those. What are that case two and case three, which we did, which I just spoke, structure the data into proper format. And uh, third one, make sure you use a proper and uh, well-defined ML algorithms, right? So we will see that how we can do that and how we can improve the accuracy to uh, acceptable levels. Okay. So we had, we have to discretize G3. Okay. So now when I say we have to discretize G3, as I said, uh, to decide the classes, you can take a random classes or you can take some judgment of how the values in G3 are distributed. And then you can further decide the range, how the G3's range have to be done. 
right so so by default here what we take into account is we take into account unsupervised learning task as well okay so for for few examples what we'll do is for a, some specific case i'll go into clustering so what is clustering clustering is unsupervised one so i want to see if i run some unsupervised clustering analysis on my g3 attribute on that g3 column i want to see is there any scope for clustering so i want to see what is naturally how the grades are classified or how they are uh, properly classified into that right so what i'll do is i'll try to apply a unsupervised clustering algorithm so what was my intention to apply clustering on g3 to know how my classes are grouped naturally so if i do not put any class label on that how my uh, values in this g3 attribute are naturally clustered like naturally they could be grouped so if i if i if i uh, if i for example if i discuss the grades of isc naturally there is some group like there might be a group where student might score less than 10 and there might be a group where most of the students have scored between 10 to 20 and a very few group who have scored more than 20 so when you learn when you run clustering algorithms on that or when you try to apply clustering task and check what are the natural clusters in that the clustering algorithm will find this group of objects like how and where the data values are clustered more this gives me an idea about how to split the range of that g3 attribute into proper classes instead of going on random classes fine have you understood my purpose of uh, discussing uh, the clustering have you understood have you understood what why i am why i have suddenly i have introduced clustering and why i am talking about this so i want to see how are naturally group how, how are this g3 values are naturally grouped okay so inside clustering uh, there are various algorithms to do that but uh, see if you want to go for natural clustering then i personally here for this problem i prefer to use expectation maximization so this works on probability and it naturally finds uh, what exactly is the number of clusters and here the number of clusters are automatically found so i don't want to me decide that i i want three clusters four clusters or five clusters so i want it to automatically decide what are the naturally in terms of probability measure how natural clusters the data can be divided so i apply expectation maximization so you can see here mean number of clusters is minus 1 it means that uh, it indicates so when you okay when i set it to minus 1 select the number of clusters automatically by cross uh, cross validation so for this ability i am using this or else for some any uh, another kind of clustering most people they prefer to use k means or uh, agglomerative clustering algorithm which are tree based clustering algorithms but here i want to automatically find that's why i am using em em stands for expectation maximization based clustering algorithm and here you want to ignore few attributes right i want to run this only on g3 so what i'll do is uh okay so these these attributes are ignored and only g3 is selected i hope you are getting that whatever is selected and that they are ignored and now when i click on start and i'm i am passing entire training set i'm passing entire training set so i'll click on start so you can see that 
once i run that all these attributes we have ignored only i ran clustering on g3 and on running the clustering on g3 how many clusters it automatically found it automatically found three clusters right and each cluster has some uh, special feature like cluster 0 whatever the values between cell cluster 0 the values mean value is 14 what cluster 1 is 0 and cluster 2 is 10 somewhere around 9.2 somewhere around 10 so what we will do is now we will uh, decide the classes based on these cluster what are the automatically which we have obtained this so to get this what we will do is we will visualize the cluster assignment so in the visualize cluster as what i'll do is on y okay on y what let me do one thing on y i will plot g3 values and on x and on x here i will plot cluster and here i will slightly increase the jitters to plot the points in a visually appealing way okay so now you can see that my clustering algorithm was naturally able to cluster the values inside g3 in this what the purpose of looking at this graph is i would like to see is there any clearly defined boundary if it is a clearly defined boundary it means that they can be naturally very well classified if there is no clearly defined well boundary here then there could be some issues then there could be issues so which clusters you see they are clearly separate so cluster 1 and uh 0 so cluster 0 and cluster 1 there is a very clear boundary so i can i can use this to define two classes here and if you see cluster 1 and cluster 2 there is a clear boundary what are two mixing one is what is little worrisome to me is uh the this points okay they are overlapping these points are overlapping this right so let me do one thing okay so now i think here i have plot cluster 0 cluster 1 and cluster 2 so now if i see here how should see the grade values were from 0 to 20 how should my range be so that i can properly make sure each class has some set of values in that can you guess so for this i think i can i can put 0 to 5 that will make sure that these cluster assignments can come into a class label 0 to 5 then i can say 5 to 10 10 to 15 so if i say 10 to 15 i'll be putting all this one but still it would be wrong thing to do because you have a two different clusters coming in one class so i think 0 to 5 will work here and if i can put this range to this only to this this value here then it should be 10 to 15 so what if i do create a classes based on a gap of 5 so 0 to 5 5 to 10 10 to 15 and 15 to 20 how many classes that would create if i if i take a stride width of 5 how many classes i i can do that can you reply if i put a stride width of 5 because i can see this in 5 this is clustered and in 5 to 10 i can take this pieces and in 10 to 15 i can include this both and from 15 to 20 i can include this remaining grades so if i take a stride boundary of 5 0 to 5 5 to 10 10 to 15 i'll get i'll get four classes so let us do one thing based on this clustering input what are the input which we received from this clustering what we will do is we will now try to put this uh, g3 for four classes so now what i'll do is i'll apply filtering unsupervised attribute what was that discrete and i want this discretization to be done on last column 
and when it is done on last column i want the classes to be ignored and uh, number of bins how many i want 4 0 to 5 5 to 10 10 to 15 15 to 20 four ranges i want i mean i want this g3 column to be split into four classes automatic the class division would be 0 to 5 and that okay so once i apply this let's see what happens okay now you can see that g3 is split into uh, this now you can see that we have four classes and you can see that most of values are concentrated around this two and three uh, now let us see let us apply some classification algorithm on this and uh, let us see what kind of accuracy we get and uh, how we can further take this to improve the accuracy uh, ahead very well so one two three four classes so now i have all this okay now let us do one thing what we will do is we'll go to classification now uh, when we apply to this classification so last time what algorithm we have applied can you recall what was that algorithm which we applied last time can anyone can any student recall what was the classification algorithm we applied on the data set Can you just recall and tell me what was that algorithm? Mm, K-means is clustering. Na. K means is clustering. No, no. Uh, what I was talking about, we ran this data set in last lecture as well. But when we ran this algorithm last time, yeah, I think we applied nav bias and uh, some tree based algorithm right both times we got 34 percent in accuracy which was not acceptable to us right so what i'll do is once again i'll apply nav bias algorithm classification class label is g3 you have to always select the class label and by default it is last one uh, cross validation 10 folds and since i have uh, see now here you if you look at this g3 You can see that how these values are balanced. So if you see here, here I have this class values are very less. So if you take 10 fold cross validation, the total number of instances, how many there? are? The total number of instances are 395. If you split it into 10 parts, uh, how many I will be getting 40 parts, right? Out of 40, these two are occupying and when i train it on cross validation with 10 folds so training is effectively happening on one fold two fold third fold fourth fold, so on to 10. so look at this uh, behavior of cross validation the problem with this do you see the problem what i think you have 395 10 fold means divide this into 10 parts so 390 30 almost consider this uh, 400 consider this is 400 divided by 10 means 40 so you are training on um, the first training happens on one fold so think in a 40 samples how many samples of this class 1 and class 4 will be there so you, you can see that there is a class imbalance right and for training to work properly, you would always like to include more sampling from this. So one thing to note is obviously this cross fold validation always takes a stratified sampling. I mean, stratified sampling means the folds are divided in a such a way that uh, every time you create a fold, it ensures that every class is properly represented in that fold, right? So if I say, and uh, so in your class, if I have, if I say 70% uh, score average and 30% uh, score uh, above average. And if I want to take a sample of uh, students, I need to take a sample such that the sample two also has this distribution of 70, 30. 
only then then training would be fine if not i take a sub sample which only contains all above average student and i train my model that would be wrong way of training that so 10 folds means i'm worried about this k value 10 so 40 samples you are getting in 40 assume that how many samples of this so you might get uh, if you look at this i think it is almost four times or so 40 times more than this are you getting what i'm trying to tell that so what i'll do is since the class imbalance is very high i'll reduce the folds to 5 because i want this sampling to include more samples since there is a class imbalance and if i split this uh, k into very small values i always run into risk of underfitting for this two classes which has a less number of samples compared to this remaining two classes so what i have done i have reduced the folds uh, now i am applying new bias and let me check okay so what's the accuracy i am getting now 45 do you see this is it better is it better than last time what we received what was the accuracy last time we had i don't think it it was in in the range of 40 it was around 34 right now it is 45 obviously better than that very significant improvement okay so now let us decide should we settle for this see whenever in a classification when you want to go for measuring uh, uh, the accuracy i would generally say that do not go on this value what is most important for a classification is this this field is most important when you want to check the practical ability of a classifier so here you can see here we have something called as roc area roc means receiver operating curve it is nothing but it's a plot of true positive rate versus false positive rates okay so when we plot this roc curve then that is a value of uh, it, it's a graph it's a graph which indicates uh, the value between true positive rate and false positive rate and if i talk about prc area i'm talking about precision recall curve i have a precision i have a recall so they are plotted on one two dimensional graph such that you get some curve and how much area is under that curve it's what it indicates the performance of classifier so out of all this most popular and widely used industry metric to always measure the performance of uh, uh, classifier is this roc roc means some people also call this rock curve rock area as well but i prefer to call it roc roc stands for receiver operating curve which is nothing but what it is it's a plot of true positive rate on y axis and false positive rate on uh, x axis so when you plot these two values for each and every sample for some we will we will discuss how this roc area is a valuable metric in separate lecture as of now just look start we will interpret this values so whenever the roc value is around 0.5 if it is around 0.5 or if if they are less than 0.5 what it indicates that indi it indicates that the performance of classifier cannot be trusted so if i say let us suppose if i consider any one class and if i see the roc value is 0.5 0.5 means 50% are classified as correct and 50 uh, 50% are classified as wrong so that is as good as just randomly classify so whatever the classifier you have built that performs as if you have randomly picking class and you are randomly uh, assigning the values that doesn't make any sense so even if you do random guessing on that you will get the same performance if you apply your classifier you still get the same performance so always the receiver operating this area area value under rock curve this value has to be always greater than 0.5 if it is towards 1 that's the best the most perfect classifier would be that classifier which has its roc 
area value for each of classes as one that's the best and most idealistic classifier you can have but in real time we may not have it so we always look for the values which are very near to one i mean 0.9 0.8 0 0.918 8 or 775 is also fine too that is acceptable up to the domain so looking at this values here whatever the classifier which we built is it better than the random classifier yes it is better than randomly guessing that why because slightly it is above 5 but are they acceptable to us maybe not because i want little bit more reliability in predicting the class of a student like I want to know how the student can uh, do well. Okay, so now if you look at this, I'm getting increase in that. Let me do one thing. If I do some different values, now since I have a classes, and how many attributes I have? Do you see here how many attributes I have? From 1 to 30. So I have 30 attributes to predict value for G3. Do you think I should use all 30? Or should we explore some subset of features which might be more powerful in predicting the class level for G3? There are always these two possibilities. You might think that all features might be contributing in building a classifier for G3, or some of this classifier, some of these attributes may be more valuable to predict G3, and other attributes might be leading to overfitting. That could be also case. How do I explore this? How do I explore this uh, concept? So to explore this concept, what I'll do is I'll go to this uh, select attributes. See, initially we went to clustering. We did found that uh, our natural clustering in that. Then we made a range based on that. We applied classification. We found 45 and we have ROC values of these values, right? Now, as an ML engineer, I was curious enough to do I need all these features. So here in the select attributes, you have a concept called a CFA subset eval. What, the, what it does, it tries to find a subset of attributes which might be more or most relevant to predict the class label G3. So we will run this. So it will give me a set of attributes which might be very much uh, relevant or might be highly correlated with class and it might help me in ignoring the attributes or features which might not have or which which do not make any sense in predicting the class for G3. So let me apply this then I'm using best first I'm using full train set and uh, I want this to be with respect to ability to predict value for G3. Now I'll click on start. So when you click on this, what it has done, it has analyzed all these attributes. It has applied few of its internal algorithms. And what it has decided, it had decided that these metrics, these are more valuable in predicting G3 than all these 30 attributes. Are you getting? Have you understood what we have done? Instead of using 30 feature sets, which might increase the model complexity and which might result into overfitting, I was just curious to know, are all 30 features important to predict the class label? So what I have found when I run the CFS subset eval, that these attributes or these features are more important to predict G3 than the other remaining one. So I would like to repeat the experiment with only these features. And I would see if, the, if that improves the accuracy or not. OK, this is one thing. There is one more filtering, which I prefer most of the times. It is info gain. Like it tells you, I hope you can see that it evaluates the worth of an attribute by measuring information gain with respect to class. So it checks what this checks. It checks how much information is there in that attribute, which can be useful to predict the class value. OK, so I'm running this twice. One, I have checked the subset and one I am checking the information gain. So here, I am interested in this top values. Maybe I'll took that. Do you see something uh, common in this? For example, here I have P status, M job is mother's job, failures, schools up. I don't know what this they said, but absences. 
so they said these attributes are better so if i talk about information gain do you see those values absences failures they are already there in this okay absences and failures so these are way two very valuable attributes p status is it in this uh, yes okay this is okay this is among first 50% of important values okay then uh, schools up and uh, this schools up and this okay so they are in this what are the attributes which i have they are usually in the, in the first 50 percent of this i mean they are really valuable in terms of prediction of a class so all these are what what's the indication that these do not have any effect on predicting the class level so if you include this it in, it improves the it increases the model complexity but it never helps in improving the accuracy of a, or the predictability of a classifier so better we ignore them so what we will do is so we will only select these attributes so can i will just paste it here and i just want it reference while selecting them okay so now what i'll do i'll once again go to pre processing uh i will only select them and remaining i'll just leave i'll remove that so what was that mother's job uh failures and uh, school sir uh romantic i don't know how what uh, it sounds absurd i we need to check data how does it affect ability of grades and uh, absences okay so p status mother's job failures school sub okay so we'll only select this we'll only select this and rest we will remove them rest we will remove them okay so now i have a data set which has the features which i am in, interested and the class label so this what i'll do is i'll once again come back to classification i will recreate this so what i am doing reapply this models configuration and once again i'll click on start so here you see here that this is this contains all that and here it contains uh, only this four attributes but still is there an improvement in this values see accuracy has increased what else has increased do you see improvement in this what was that earlier earlier 70 61 68 63 now okay now you can see that it has improved slightly better what was that 70 from 70 i made 75 from 62 62 okay it has improved only for this third class it is failing that okay so do you see that i have little more few more improvement now what we have done we will we have eliminated the discrepancies for case 2 case 2 is improper structured data and that so now i think we are in a better position i have a properly range properly labeled g3 i have a most valuable feature sets which are important to g3 based on the subset evaluation and info gain attribute now what is more important to me is now data is fine now i want to see if changing any of this classifier will it give me a better value or not so you can apply various types of classification but i'll tell you for this uh, see basically how is this what are you trying to predict you are pre trying to predict a value for a attribute to fall within a specific range right so if you want this you can think of this task as if you can perfectly estimate that value if you can perfectly estimate that value you can put it in a right class right so let me think let me uh, let me talk to you in some different way so i want to predict likelihood of students appearing for ml iac 2 to uh, either below average average and above average right so i will i will set a few range like if you score below 10 i'll call below average if you score in between 20 to 20 i'll call you as average and if you score more than 20 i'll call you as above average i want to predict your ability to come into this 
so if i want to classify you perfectly into these three classes see my end problem is to classify you into, into three classes you students so if i want to classify you into three classes i need to have some model which can at least predict likely with some good error margin how much marks you are expected to score so i need to have an ml model which can predict or which can guess how many marks you will score so it see if i say you my ml model is initially predicting that a student y a student x may be scoring mark as 12 marks so i'm not worried about is that student perfectly getting 12 marks or not but i want to know you should be able to predict marks as 12 plus 2 or minus 2 because i am trying to classify you in the range of 10 to 20 so first i need to learn my model needs to first learn how well i can guess your marks to what accurate value i can guess your marks if i can accurately guess your marks then that will result into accurate classification as well are you getting are you getting my uh, what point i'm trying to discuss so if i want to guess your marks guessing your mask see i'm not classifying i'm trying to guess your marks if i want to guess your marks can you guess uh, what should i do should i do regression or should i do classification if i want to guess the marks preferably or perhaps this looks like a regression so in classification i have an algorithm here i have an algorithm which is something we call as a uh, logic boost so what does it stand so see here you have something classification via regression and logic boost these are two algorithms what they do is which they internally they classify based on regression i mean they will first try to regress on g3 level they will try to guess how many marks this candidate is expected to do once they can accurately regress the values they can easily classify that into range so that was that so this prefers works better so i want to just see and i want to know how much this gives accuracy okay you can see that the moment i applied logic boost it which means uh, logical based uh, regression based classification i will also apply classification via regression okay so this this performs slightly better than this one so logic boost how much is accuracy now 54% do you see this accuracy what i'm getting and do you see the improvement in rsc values so from here 75 i directly went this do you see significant improvement yes significantly they are better than our earlier classifiers right yes so this is one thing like now what we were doing is once we predicted how the data can be modeled now i'm looking at what algorithm might be best for this to decide this i need to understand the underlying semantics of the domain what value can predict what is how the values might be related so based on that you need to do this experiment like you need to check for multiple types of algorithm some algorithms perform better for specific use cases it is 54 remember from 34 from last lecture we have come to a point where our accuracy is around 54% do you think we can still improve can you reply in chat window do you think we can still improve this can any student guess like can we improve or not can you reply okay so let me do one thing now there is one since uh, if i'm once again if i recall this classification i did it on clustering so whenever i can do a clustering it means that it has naturally predicted three classes based on mean or how the values are centered so now if you look at uh, if you look at vigilus clusters you can see how the values are centered here okay so 
once i saw that this values are centered around a group of this group of clustered i can one i there is one more classification algorithm which can uh, help me which works on grouping of objects into one class or ability of their class to form a groups which is knn k nearest neighbor it works on a function it, it's an another algorithm and uh, the knn algorithm is under lazy set of algorithms because these are something which learn once they all go through all training set so they do not learn directly by looking at that so this is a k nearest neighbor classifier i will apply this k nearest neighbor classifier and then i'll see what kind of accuracy i'll get here so how much accuracy i'm getting here so you can see here that now i am not getting much for this k nearest neighbor one okay so i think the maximum thing which i got is for this 54 okay i think if i get it for 54 you can still apply uh, what i what i say is you can still apply some uh, bagging and boosting as well uh let me see if i can apply add a boost so i'll apply add a boost so it applies on boosting and i want the base classifier to be what was that i was talking about logic boost uh i want this to be based on this okay still it is so there is not much improvement okay so i think you can see that uh logistic based uh classification i mean regression as a base learner and classifier on top of that is what which gives you the best accuracy of uh, 54% i think if i am not wrong we can also improve this so for this nearest neighbors it got me 40 uh, but values are okay so if i reapply this model configuration and if i see and if i try to change k value okay so the k value is having an effect okay so 54 is fine because see i am more relying on this i want this to be better than 0.5 and you can see that this has a fairly good amount of accuracy than what we had uh, uh, last time okay meta and this okay so i hope uh, you understood like how we uh, tend to solve this machine learning problems so what is conclusion the conclusion is that when you get a data set it is not that we directly come and we directly apply ml and we get a classification no there is lot stuff to do inside this which includes looking at the attributes the importance of attributes checking for overfitting checking for other and uh, Tried in trying to find right ML algorithm because that's why in ML machine learning life cycle you can see that choosing learning type and choosing algorithm are very critical steps in machine learning cycle. Okay, so I think in next lecture we will uh, discuss more on uh, the ROC curve. What exactly is this ROC curve and how it helps me understand? So this is what I call it as ROC curve. what is this value indicating so this value of 0.87 87% was obtained from this roc curve what what is roc curve and why this is very most used metric in industry to decide the strength of classifier why it is that important we will see that and uh, then we will what we'll do is see now uh, 
I'll not take much minute. I think I've already exceeded by too many too much time. So what we will do see in next lecture is we'll see what is that ROC curve and how you have built a model. And let us suppose, see, we can also improve this accuracy multiple times, but I will leave it to you to try and find out what algorithm combination, what is giving you highest accuracy. You can go for attribute selection. I'll leave it to you. Uh, initially, I want you to try. Still, if you're not able to do that, then I will give you an idea how you can improve further. I will give you a clue. But I want you to do this exercise of exploring this ML algorithms in Weka and understand how exactly it works and whatnot and all that. But let me tell you, you have developed a model, right? You can save this model. Whatever the models which you're developing, you can always save these models. For example, let me save it on desktop. I'll what I'll call it as student grade prediction model. So I can save this model file. Once I save this trained model file, whenever I want to predict this, for example, you want to build a website where you will, student will enter values and you will ask him to predict the value. Uh, you will predict his uh, likelihood, whether he will be, be performing better, low average or something. So there you have to use this trained model. Remember, you need not train again and again when you want to use this model. Once the model is developed, you can always use this model to predict the values for newer instances. I mean, some of the values which student will give to us. So how do I use the saved model file? What are the model file which I have right now I have? How do you save this? You have saved this model, right? Now, once you have saved this model, how do you prefer to use this? It's, it, it is also important. Like now we have saved this model. We will write a Java program. Weka is usually a Java one. That's why we will write a Java program where we will load this model and we will do a real time prediction for a real world use case. Like we will generate some sample uh, student values like mother job failure and that. Then my Java program will predict a value for this G3 label based on the model which we have trained and saved on the my hard disk. So that completes the end of life cycle. What, what I call it is end of this life cycle, deployment of machine learning model for production uses. Once you deploy, you monitor the real world use case. And after going for multiple prediction, if you find the model is not acceptable, what do you do? You come back to earlier things. Once again, you look at data. Once again, you look at algorithms and you keep on improving this. So this in turn forms a machine learning life cycle. So here, what I wanted to say is that you need not every time write a Python code and all that. You can build an ML model, perfectly working model in Weka, save this model and write a program. You can even write a Python program to use trained Weka model file. We have a Weka wrapper for Python as well. Okay, so that I will leave it to you to explore in, Python, uh, in practical, but as of now, in the next lecture, we will look at how to use this saved model to predict for real time values. Okay. And that along with the ROC curve, we'll understand why it is important metric and how I, we trust on this more instead of these values. Okay. Okay. So before I end this lecture, uh, have you understood this? Have you found it useful first? Have you found it useful? The way we took the data set, we did it, we get 34% accuracy, then we improved and we, we got to 54%. Yes. Okay. So in the next lecture, we will try to complete the pipeline. We will write a Java program and that completes the pipeline. You will get an idea how to develop real world machine learning applications for end customers. Okay. So I'll upload this recording. And uh, we will discuss in uh, next lecture. Maybe I think tomorrow is holiday, right? Tomorrow is Ram Naomi. If tomorrow is holiday, I don't think we can have a lecture. Then we'll have it on Thursday. And let me know in a Telegram group if you still want the guest lectures to be organized as, as part of ML lecture series. Okay, so uh, sorry for taking your uh, extra time, but I wanted to complete this discussion. Uh, hope you understand. Uh, that's it for this lecture. Just mark your attendance. You should be fine to leave. And uh, take care because uh, there are too much of COVID cases. I don't want any student to suffer because of this.
Take care and uh, be safe.